Hey, it's Ethan Skolnick for the Five on the Floor podcast here at American Airlines Arena. That's still what it's called. After the Miami Heat win 129-100 to over the Houston Rockets on a Sunday night to raise their record to 5-1 and one before heading out on the road. Before we head into this podcast, I want to tell you about one of the great sponsors of the Five Reason Sports Network, and that is AutoNation. Why AutoNation? Because they're the largest retailer from coast to coast, and their friendly and knowledgeable staff here in South Florida will help you save big on a huge selection of new cars, trucks, and SUVs, Toyota, Honda, Chevrolet, Mercedes-Benz, and much, much more. And if you're looking to buy pre-owned, shop AutoNation's huge selection of one-price pre-owned vehicles, clearly marked with one price, their lowest price guaranteed. You want to get rid of that old car, turn it into cash today, get a top dollar offer, and a check the very same day. They'll buy your car with no purchase necessary. Here's the most important thing. You need to DM me at 5 Reason Sports. That's the number five, Reason Sports. I will put a senior manager directly in touch with you so they can walk you through the entire buying process. No dealing with just any old salesperson. You're going to deal with a senior manager to get you the best possible deal in the car that you want. So it's autonation.com, but DM me at Five Reasons Sports. And now on with today's episode. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a Miami Heat and NBA podcast from Ethan Skolnick with Alvon Sydney, aka Alf954. Brought to you by the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, Ethan Skolnick here at American Airlines Arena where they're breaking it down after the Miami Heat broke down the Houston Rockets. First, I'm here with Zach Buckley. I'm going to be here with Christopher Maddox a little bit later. Alf and Alex are still recovering from, I don't know what the hell they were doing in New Orleans, but hopefully they, well, I don't know if it's hopefully they survived. We'll see. But what a weekend for South Florida sports. Everybody won. The Heat were the last to win. The Dolphins won. Some people weren't happy about that. FAU won. FIU won. The Panthers won. I was there last night up at bb t Center. We also had a Hurricanes win against FSU, which wasn't just a win. They got the coach fired, Willie Taggart. And Masvidal won, too, against Diaz in, in UFC. So seven for seven. But this was probably, the well, maybe Nate Diaz would qualify. But this was probably the best opponent that anybody faced, the Houston Rockets coming in here. And this was the most thorough beating of any of those uh, games. This thing was 46-14 to 14 after the first quarter. The Heat finish up with 38 assists, 38 assists on 47 made baskets. At one point, it was 27 of 30. They looked like an elite team tonight, Zach. They did, and I think what's interesting is kind of where they got it from because if you mapped out different routes to 129 points, I can't think that there's too many, but you'd think, you know, Jimmy Butler's got to have 30. Kendrick Nunn's got to have 20. Tyler Hero, you know, None and Hero combined to go five for 20. Right? Jimmy doesn't force the issue just like he has in, uh, the whole time he's playing. He leads away with nine assists. They just really – they move the ball well. They move off the ball very smartly. Houston defensively looked like a team that maybe had a little too much fun down here last night, a little sluggish. But Miami stuck to the ball movement, the back cuts, the player movement, and really just gouged them and, and took what they gave them. Um, it's funny to say this about a team that shoots 50, 40, 77, 129 points. I didn't think this was the Heat's best game. Uh, you know, they, they, they took what was there. They took advantage, and, and I think that's what good or, or maybe great teams do. Yeah, and we're seeing, you know, at times there's even some overpassing because I, I feel like everybody wants to get everyone else involved. But here's what I take from him. You mentioned, you know, Jimmy Butler didn't have a huge scoring game. He got off to a good start scoring and then backed off a little bit or, or started to miss some shots. Plus 29 tonight for Jimmy, which tied for tops on the team with Myers Leonard. And when I asked Eric Spolster after the game when he realized that the ball movement was going to be so good this season, like at what point? Was it camp? Was it where, at what stage? He immediately mentions, without me sort of leading him in that direction, Jimmy Butler. And I feel like he's been going that way all along, where the whole idea here is that Jimmy has set a tone, the other players have followed it, and they have you know, pretty much four to five good passers on the floor at all times. Like... Bam Adebayo is an elite passer for a center. Jimmy Butler is a plus passer. Myers Leonard is a plus passer for a big. Kendrick Nunn, I don't know if he's a plus passer, but he's a competent passer. Goran Dragic is maybe not a plus passer for a point guard, but he's still a point guard, okay? So he's another ball handler you have on the floor. I think we've seen Tyler Hero is a good passer, and somebody we'll talk about a little bit later. James Johnson is a good passer, and he played a role tonight as well. Kelly Olenek is a good passer for a big. So pretty much 
everybody that they put on the floor can pass and will pass. And I don't want to make this every podcast a referendum on Hassan Whiteside. But this is one of the reasons, Zach, that when I talked to people inside the organization, they were so happy that he was gone because they felt like with him and to a certain degree, Dion, that they were never going to get to the kind of offense they wanted to get to when those guys were playing heavy minutes because it's just a style of play thing. It's just, it's not, you know, with Dion, I think he's a willing passer. Hassan, not so much, but I think Dion is a willing passer. But the problem with Dion is that his natural style of play is going to be high usage. And this is just not a team that can afford a high usage player. And you had this stat. This is now in six games. They've had five different leading scorers. Kendrick Nunn's the only guy who's been twice. And the only guy who it hasn't been so far is Jimmy Butler. Yeah, that's for so many different, you know, avenues, again, to, to, to a five and one start. No one could have imagined this, that, that Jimmy doesn't have to lead the way. One of my preseason sort of hot takes is that Jimmy would have sort of maybe a slightly milder version of, of last year's Paul George where he just jumps in because I thought the numbers were going to have to be that good if this team was going to make the leap. And, you know, maybe, maybe this shifts over the course of the season, maybe doesn't need that many, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what's so phenomenal. And like Spolster said, you have to run this through Jimmy in terms of just the, the, the egalitarian approach and the sharing of the ball. I think back to what he told you at camp, you know, who says I'm the best player? Well, Eric said it after the game, and we all know he is, but just that approach and that mindset, I think he actually takes that to the floor and just the confidence that he's given to guys who, like we've talked about, have, have chips on their shoulder. A lot of guys who are counted out elsewhere and, and no, had no expectations He's put a lot on them, and obviously they've responded. All right, so let's look at a couple guys in particular here because you know we're getting an expectation with Bam, and he didn't have a big numbers night tonight either. He was 8-5, and he had the five assists again, but four turnovers, which was the most on the team. You mentioned Kendrick Nunn, 2 of 10 tonight. I've been saying he hasn't had a bad game since Summer League. Well, here was the first one, 19 minutes, 2 of 10 from the floor. He was still a plus 18. Tyler Hero, 3 of 10 from the floor tonight. He did have the four free throws. thing with him, though, is... Seven rebounds, seven assists for Tyler. So he gave you something in other ways. But I want to talk about two guys in particular here. Duncan Robinson and Myers Leonard are two of the players who have been put in the starting lineup. Myers all the time and Duncan some of the time. No Justice Winslow tonight. That fans have been complaining about. When Myers Leonard is, he doesn't move his feet enough on defense. He's a liability there. If he's not making shots, then he's not as useful to you. Sort of the same thing with Duncan Robinson in some ways. Duncan Robinson now is shooting like he's seven of 11 from three tonight. Okay. Myers Leonard, only one of two from three, but he may have had eight other field goals. And as I said, plus 29, still had four, you know, four rebounds in 27 minutes. Not great, but he's been rebounding at a plus rate. I think what we're seeing now is there should be a certain amount of trust in Eric Spolster that if he identifies something in a player, that they're going to get something out of that player. It might not be every night, but we saw Duncan Robinson almost save the game from them in Minnesota. And now Myers has had at least two big games so far. And for the most part, you know, has outplayed Kelly Olenek. Although, you know, Kelly wasn't bad tonight, had the eight rebounds, you know, and six points. But Myers Leonard has done his job. And I think my overall point to fans is they need to relax about one game with some of these guys because they're going to have a bad game. If Kendrick Nunn had a bad, had this game in the first game of the season, people would have been wondering what Spolster, Spolster was doing starting him. But because the game comes after five really, really good games, there's not an issue. So I, I just think there needs to be a certain trust level that he's identified things in certain players and that they're going to get minutes. Absolutely. And I, I think he's identified things that, that they're going to need. You know, one of the biggest questions with this team was, was shooting coming into the year. And Spolster comes out and says, you know, hey, Duncan Robinson's one of the best shooters on the planet. Probably caught a lot of people off guard when he said that. But, you know, Duncan's in there. He's playing a specific role. And what I like tonight is there was no hesitation. If he had an inch, he was firing. That's what you're out there to do. You know, fans will complain because, yeah, he's got some shortcomings, right? He's not the most athletic guy. He's going to have some trouble in some certain defensive matchups. But he took advantage of his chances tonight and, and didn't hesitate to do so. And I thought Myers did the same thing, just back cutting them to death. He was always on the move, always seemingly right on time. And you looked at how Houston approached this game. They threw James Harden at both of them, right, trying to hide them. And, you know, maybe that's what we're seeing with this team. There isn't necessarily a weak link. So when you go to hide somebody, well, now you're hiding them on guys who combined for 44 points on 23 shots. You know, it's like you said, Spolster's seen something in these guys that's going to have value to this team. 
if it, you know, even if it uh, hurts you in some other areas, they're going to do enough where they're going to provide value on most nights. And I think that's what good coaches do. It's not, you know, what can't you do? It's what's the one thing that you can do for me? And let me figure out how to take advantage of that. And you notice this during the game. We talk about out of bio. They were throwing out of bio on Harden frequently in this game after they threw him on Giannis. And so I don't really care so much that Bam only ended up with eight points and four rebounds or five rebounds tonight because he's giving you the most important thing that you need against Houston, which is a, an extra guy to guard James Harden. I want to switch here, and then we're going to go to Chris Maddox after this. But James Johnson. We've been saying on the podcast, Alf and me and Alex, that there's going to be a role for James Johnson once he gets himself in shape. Now, Deion Waiters is a different deal. People notice he wasn't on the bench tonight. Supposedly, he was working out up at the practice floor during the game. A little bit of a strange juxtaposition. But I, what I've said with Deion, it's not so much an attitude thing. It's a fit thing. I just don't know where the minutes come from and where his style of play fits on this team unless he's going to adjust it. James Johnson doesn't need to adjust his style of play. He just needs to be in shape to defend. That's all. And, and I think what you saw tonight, and we, we, Eric talked about him being a Swiss Army knife, is that there are certain matchups, and this was a matchup that they viewed as important enough that they could put him on hard and they can kind of – P.J. Tucker was another guy that he could physically play against, that you're going to put him in this game, and there will be other games they put him in. But when they have Derek Jones Jr. back, there may be games that Derek Jones Jr. plays in instead of James Johnson. He scores 17 tonight. Now, he's not a plus three-point shooter, but he did have – he, he ended up with three tonight, right? No, he went two tonight, two out of five from three, seven of 12 overall. He's a plus 14 in 17 minutes. How big does that role get for him? I, w I wouldn't think too much bigger. Um, I thought we saw a little, little areas that weren't problematic tonight but maybe could be. Um, you know, when we've seen kind of point James Johnson in the past – uh, sometimes he calls his own number a little too much, you know, maybe not the playmaker. And I think Eric, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but sort of walked his way around that in terms of, you know, like we'll, we'll get him some touches. It was kind of like, you know, you're not going to see the old, we're going to run through James Johnson for different stretches. But like you said, there's a lot of defensive matchups that he's going to work on. When you can take James Harden and PJ Tucker in the same game, uh, you know, you've almost run the gamut in terms of, you know, who you're going to run up against. So, the athleticism, the defense, they're going to need that. He's got a little more size, a little more bulk than Derrick Jones, so maybe that helps him. But, yeah, I think, you know, they just got a lot of bigs who do a lot of different things, and I think they're going to be able to cycle through them, and that's probably the, the strength of this front court. And if they end up with a situation where Bam ends up in foul trouble and they need a small ball big, I think James Johnson gets those minutes. What we can't forget here is whatever you think of Dion. And whatever you thought Derek Jones Jr.'s role was going to be, they had three rotation players, what we projected as rotation players at the beginning of the season out against the Houston Rockets and throttled them. No Winslow, no Waiters. I know he's not part of the equation right now, but he was. No Derek Jones Jr. And, I mean, they handled them. I, I mean, you know, Harden ended up getting 29, but it was uh, – he needed 14 free throws to do it. He was 3 of 9 from 3. He had 6 turnovers, 13 turnovers, 13 turnovers from Harden and Westbrook. And I didn't see this number before. Did you see what Westbrook's plus minus was? <laughs> I mean, how, how minus 46. Russell Westbrook was a minus 46 tonight, and he got overrated chants in this building that were loud. And I don't know, really know where that came from because there were a lot of Heat fans. We got receipts on this. There were a lot of Heat fans who wanted Russell Westbrook, uh, and I was one of those who thought they should trade for him. I'll acknowledge that. Al fought me on that. He got overrated chance here in the arena tonight. That's Zach Buckley. You can find him at, what is it? I always forget. Zach Buckley NBA. That Zach Buckley NBA with an, with an H, not a K. Be right back with Christopher Maddox. Right now, I want to tell you about one of the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. That is the Seltzer Mayberg Law Firm. You can find them at onecalllegal.com. That's spelled out one, O-N-E, calllegal.com. They handle cases of all kinds from all over the state. It's not just traffic cases. They will handle just about any case for you. Personal injury is another specialty of theirs. So reach out through onecalllegal.com. They've got someone there 24 hours a day. We know all the people there, whether it's David or Mindy, or also Eric, who's a big Hurricanes fan, so he'll be in a good mood this weekend if you reach out after they not only beat FSU, but got Willie Taggart fired. So it's Seltzer Mayberg. They're based in North Miami, One Call Legal. Dot com. All right, I've kicked Zach Buckley out. Well, not really. That was good stuff. Uh, we've kicked Alf and Alex out, actually. I don't know if I'm going to let them back in. They're kind of like the Dion Waiters of this situation, and 
they've been Kendrick Nunned by Christopher Maddox. But before we go to Christopher Maddox, there was a little bit of controversy about your last appearance. A little bit of controversy. Really? Yes, there was. Pronounce Spolstra for me twice. uh, Spolestra. (laughs) Spolestra, Spolestra, Spolstra. Is that like the palestra? Is that like the... uh, You know, you said Spolestra. You said Spolestra. You're the only person I've ever heard. Zach in the background, have I? Have you ever heard anybody pronounce it Spolestra? How no. are you supposed to pronounce it? Spolstra. Oh, Spolstra. Oh, he's not spe. He's spo. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Everybody loved like the content for Chris Maddox, the word of the day, the whole thing. But everybody's like, where the hell did this Spolestra come from? I'm gonna throw that one at Spo. I've never I've never heard it pronounced that way before. But anyway, Christopher Maddox is here with me at Champion Life. It's funny because people were tweeting at me like I didn't realize it. I did realize it when you did it twice, but I, it was your first time doing that pod with me, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to correct you. All right, so let's get to some big picture stuff here because we kind of covered the specifics of this game with Zach. But I think it's important for us to put this into some context. When you were on the pod with me this week, we said, "What happens if they beat Houston?" Everybody's going to start to notice. Well, they didn't just beat Houston. They manhandled Houston. And and I'm watching these national NBA guys, and they're trying to figure out on Twitter what the hell is going on with the Heat. And it's a lot of things that we on this pod and on Twitter have been trying to tell you for the last couple months. This team was connected. This team was unselfish. This team had clear roles. This team has really good shooting. This team is going to be good defensively. We're starting to see all of it. Do we need to modify the expectations for this team now? I've already started to modify the expectations in my mind. Um, I, this is a big win tonight, but I do feel a little disappointed. I'm wondering if Houston really came to play tonight. Like, that's how bad they got beat. And um, I was talking to Zach about it. In a way, I kind of feel like it's hard to gauge. Are we this good or was Houston just really this terrible? Um, but they looked great again tonight. Um, in the post-game locker room, spoke with Duncan Robinson, and he talked about how one of their focuses had been on backdoor cuts, kind of like running a little bit of Princeton offense kind of, and I thought that was interesting. Hadn't seen that from the Heat. And tonight, they really – it got Myers Leonard buckets. It got Duncan Robinson buckets. Duncan Robinson buckets. I'm all concerned about how I'm saying people's names. Well, those are two of the greatest Spurs in history. Probably, probably the two greatest. Those should be easy to put together. Yeah, but – um. I, A lot of guys were able to score tonight, and they scored because of this different approach to the offense, which in comparison to Houston, who was just, you know, one-on-one in the whole night, I I think we have a real good team here, and I think we're definitely going to be the talk of all of the sports shows tomorrow. Um, But we got to keep it going with another victory. And then, I don't know, I'm scared, Ethan. I'm scared to just put it out there that we are what we think we are. The reason I'm not so scared of it, is because this organization has projected such confidence from the time the camp started. Like, they knew what they had, and a lot of it was kind of their little secret. But everybody was smiling about it, and now you're starting to see it. And when Eric talks, I can always tell if Spolestra has conviction in a team because of the way he'll talk about it. So, okay, when he was talking about Hassan Whiteside or some of the other guys, He would dance around topics. He wouldn't be particularly specific. He wouldn't have some of these yarns to spin about the player. When he likes a guy, when he likes a situation, like he would have a story like about Josh Richardson taking 300 threes when Josh Richardson was starting to emerge, okay, late in the, the, what was it, the 15, 16 season when he started, we was going back and forth with the G League or D League, whatever it was called then, and then came up and couldn't miss a three, right? And he would talk about, you know, this story about, you know, him yelling at Josh Richardson to get out of the gym. He'll have a story for guys like that. With certain guys, the story's ended. He would tell one about Hassan at the beginning, and then it sort of stopped. He has a story about everybody now, and I mentioned it when I was talking to Zach that this thing about Jimmy Butler and the unselfishness and then kind of, you know, from there, Bam Adebayo and the passing. He's been very specific in the way he's talked about players, and he has a plan. And you mentioned, too, You know, we're talking about, I mean, the backdoor cuts. So I'm watching on Twitter tonight, and there's some guys who covered Myers Leonard in Portland, and they're tweeting about Myers Leonard is backdoor cutting, Myers Leonard is moving without the ball. And and I think, and I talked to Myers afterwards, I put it on Twitter, Myers talking about how guys are doing that. It's like they've had a plan for players, and they're almost pleasantly surprised that it's being executed, but it is being executed. And 
I know that they know that they're going to face maybe more talented teams at some point. The Clippers are a more talented team. The Lakers, at least at the top end, are a more talented team. But they, I think they look at it like, okay, okay, Houston at the top end is a more talented team, but they look like they didn't know how to play basketball tonight because the Heat looked like they were playing. I mean, this was like straight out of Hoosier shit like that they are running. So how long can good basketball beat better players? I guess that might be one of the questions. The Heat have good players, but I don't know that they have – I don't know that they would be top five if you were talking about top end talent. But that's a, a basketball archetype that existed for a long time. That's the Princeton offense. That's how it exists. When you're, when you're not as talented as the next best team, your, your best bet is to be smarter. And a lot of what we're seeing with the backdoor cuts and all that are guys really being smart. I was thinking as I was watching the game, I don't think Duncan Robinson has a game like this or fits in like this with any other team. I don't think Myers Leonard does because the both of those guys got maybe eight to ten points off just being in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. Myers Leonard was finding his way to the front of the basket. Me and Zach were talking about how for all of his deficiencies on defense, he's making it hard not to keep him on the court because he's active, because he's moving. And the same thing with Duncan Robinson. I mean, he took full advantage of this opportunity tonight. And in addition to the threes, which we expect, I think he had seven of them, which is crazy, um, seven threes. But aside from those threes, which you would expect from Duncan Robinson, it was the getting to the basket. And whenever they got into a lull, this is something that's been missing with the Heat, in my opinion. You get into a lull, the shots aren't falling. At least three, four times that I counted, they went, came in and went right back to the back door, whether it was Bam uh, flashing high. And then just all of the action off of Bam and Myers, I thought that was interesting. Myers in particular, they let him post up. They gave him the ball on the block, and then they cut off of it. Um, Spalestra really trusts the ball. Uh, I got you. I got you. (laughs) (laughs) I got you. I got you so self-conscious now. You're on a good run, too. (laughs) (laughs) But um, Just go with Spo. Just everybody goes with Spo. Spo really trusts these guys with the ball because he's running the offense through them. And um, I think it can continue to answer your question. I, I think one of the tried and true ways to be better talented teams is to be smarter with the ball. The other thing that ha- was great tonight, just live active hands. So many deflections um, and not fouls either. And James Harden after a while was looking for fouls, but then when he wasn't getting those calls, then he kind of receded into the background. Um, I just really like the way this team played tonight, and I think they definitely can keep it going. When we talked last time, my biggest concern was would the defense remain consistent, and tonight it did. The help defense was great on Russ. It was great on Harden. A couple times they trapped them in the corners. It was a lot of, like, really, like, um, traditional basketball, like almost college kind of basketball, and I, I love that. That, that approach to the game. And I think Coach Spo is doing a great job putting this together. And I, I like that Robinson said that, like, this was something that they had talked about. Like you were saying, they had planned for it this summer was to be a team that relied on ball movement, possibly because he knew they were going to have deficiencies um, in athleticism or in talent, like at the top end. Uh, but they looked really great tonight in executing all of that. And it raises the question now, because as I mentioned, you know, I don't know where Deion Waiters fits, but they, they re-engaged James Johnson tonight, but still no Derek Jones Jr., and that's not a long-term injury. Justice Winslow is traveling with the team out to Denver, although he said, I just like the West Coast. So I don't know if he's playing or not, but they're going to reincorporate him, obviously. He's going to be a starter when he comes back. I don't want to hear from Heat fans. They did this without justice. There is this need. I've talked about it, this zero-sum game with Heat fans where you have to tear somebody down when other players are playing well. I don't know why Heat fans cannibalize themselves that way. It doesn't make any sense to me. But you're going to end up reincorporating some of these players, and they just have a lot of guys to go to. And that can be a strength or a curse. It can be, it's, it's a strength if it's managed correctly. It's a curse if there's a problem. And I will say one of the, the weaknesses that has been mentioned to me about Spolstra through the years, if, and there are not many, by the way, but one of the weaknesses has been that at times he has not communicated that well with his role players. And that became frustrating for a lot of guys during the Big Three era. Um, and it has been frustrating since as he struggled last year in particular to kind of find the right thing. So I think his biggest job the rest of this season is 
he seems like he's gotten buy-in. Like tonight, even like Jimmy played 27 minutes. I know they were up big, but Bam played 25 minutes. Myers played 27. Duncan Robinson led the team with 35 minutes tonight. Tyler Hero had 35. Um, but is to continue to get that buy-in. He got it from Dragic, where there's certain players who understand it's just not going to be their night. And Spo almost kind of framed it after the game, and you were in there with me, as a competition between these guys. Like, this can be your night. Again, that's a fine line. Like, make it a competition where it could be your night, but also, okay, not be a ball hog so that it takes away from anybody else. I thought it was interesting that one of the first things uh, James had to say in the locker room the first thing he mentioned was buy-in. When asked about his night tonight, how did he feel being back on the court and back in the mix, one of the first things he mentioned was buying in and, and doing what he needs to do. I think the way this team is set up is that if you don't buy in, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. I think if you're one of the guys, there, there are a lot of times tonight and all throughout the season to where guys are making the extra passes. We've talked about that. Tyler, at one point, he comes down, you know, and Tyler's a, he's a gunner. And he kicks off to James, and James pulls and hits to three, and Tyler's running down the court. His hands are up. This team really does like to see each other succeed. And so you have to buy into that aspect of it. And you need depth for all of these guys to come back. Um, if you look at – just look at the Warriors right now. Two guys get hurt, and all of a sudden the entire team falls apart. It's going to be a long season. You're going to need guys like James Johnson to be able to come in and play these minutes. You're going to need this experience that Duncan Robinson got tonight later on down once, you know, Justice is back and well incorporated into everything. So right, right now what they're doing is building that foundation, that bottom level. And I think, for instance, Duncan Robinson has been around this team for a long time. He's not a role player that I think – Coach Spo <laughs> has to. Uh, I don't think Spo has to figure out how do I talk to Duncan about being a role player. I don't think he has to figure out how do I talk to, uh, say, uh, Myers Leonard about what his role is on his team because these are guys who, at least Myers Leonard's case, I mean, he's used to being a role player. That's he, he knows that that job. I think his toughest in that arena, his toughest things to deal with were Dion and James. James says. I'm buying in. I'm trying to play. I'm wondering how long or if Dion comes because it's in Dion's best interest to play the game. Yes. It's in his best interest. Even if he doesn't want to be here, you got to play so that, you know, you get some value. So it'll be interesting to see right now. He's the lone guy who's sticking out. Yeah. He's, you know, he was there to, when we were in the locker room before the game, he was here, um, you know, spoke to him. Hey, how you doing? He was here, had a sweat as if he was, had been working out, but then he's not here on the bench. So he's the guy who's sticking out right now, and the Heat don't necessarily like guys that stick out. Well, he's got to decide, you know, as he's watching this team play so well without him, like, does he really want to be that guy? You know, and, and that's, that's, does he really want to be that guy? And if the team was struggling without him, then there would be a case, but they're not. And, and so you can't say, oh, Kendrick Nunn played poorly in one game, and so I should be back out there. No, that you still won by 30. So, so it's uh, until you go through either uh, there's an injury or there's a prolonged stretch where the team is just not playing well and they need what he can provide, there's really no room for complaint there. And it's just you have to do what James Johnson did tonight, play well. And you know what? Come in, have one of those games. Maybe he has a 17-point game in 13 minutes. And then people say, oh, maybe there is a role for Dion. Because it's not like he's without a skill set. He has a skill set. He can contribute, but he hasn't really wanted to. And, you know, at least in the role that they've had, we were throwing out some, some trades today. I mean, it's going to be hard to move him. There aren't a lot of pieces around the league that make sense. You might have to package something like Derek Jones Jr. to move a Dion Waiters, you know, and maybe get, say, and this is something that our, our Greg Sylvander's thrown out too, and Marvin Williams in the last year of his deal, proven vet, 33 years old, stretch four, not a problem in the locker room. And again, last year of his contract, would that make sense? Would Charlotte want to take a flyer on DJJ and Dion, you know, because they don't have a lot of production in the backcourt? That's a possibility. I, but there's not a lot of possibilities. You know, I think people looking at Robert Covington, that's not going to happen. So it's, it, Dion has got to either get with a program or he's just going to get run over. And so far, he's been run over. That's Chris Maddox. We're going to call him Chris, uh, Coach Matt instead of Co – I don't know. We'll call you something. Uh, Zach Buckley, you can follow both these guys. Follow Maddox at Champion Life. You can follow Zach at Zach Buckley NBA. 
I'm going to have, by the time you listen to this, I'll already be recording with Bobby Marks from ESPN. So we're doing that episode this week. We're going to start bringing on national guys about once a week because I want them to explain what they're seeing when they're seeing this team because we get caught in the bubble a little bit. But I do think that this has been impressive and people can start taking notice. If Philadelphia had lost to the Blazers, and that could have happened, that was a great game. They don't, Furcon doesn't make that late shot. The Heat would be number one in the Eastern Conference right now. So people are going to start paying attention and the Sixers have some tough games coming up. Talk to you soon.